Yep. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started in a few minutes. I do notice that the best seat in the house is still um, has a lot of chairs. So there's a table up in the front um, if you want to um, to join us up in the front, you'll be able to see and hear everything the best. Um, if you have any questions, my name's Sarah, and we have our team. I'll introduce them in a minute. Um, but when we get started, we'll be um, uh, giving you much more information. So again, just a few minutes so we can let some more folks come in through the security and registration lines. Okay, it works now. All right, time is precious, so we are going to get started with this meeting. My name is Sarah Eggers, and I am part of FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. You'll hear the name CEDAR, uh, or the acronym CEDAR said throughout the day. Um, I will be the facilitator for today's meeting, and we are delighted that you are here, both in the room and on the web. Um, to join us and to provide, participate in this unique experience to provide your perspectives on this very complicated and challenging issue. Um, today's meeting is a part of an initiative we call Patient Focused Drug Development, and it's conducted in co collaboration with the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, Teresa Mullen will give some more proper welcome remarks in a few minutes, and so I have the pleasure of going through some logistics. Um, let me first, before we do that, I'd like to introduce my colleagues from FDA and from um, NIDA, that's the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, to introduce yourselves, please. Good morning, I'm Teresa Mullen, uh, and I work in the Center for Drugs. Good morning. My name is Sharon Hertz. I'm the division director for the division that reviews these products, the Division of Anesthesia, Analgesia, and Addiction Products. Good morning. I'm Celia Winchell. I'm the medical team leader for addiction products in Dr. Hertz's division. Good morning. I'm Miriam Afshar. I'm a medical reviewer in the same division. Good morning and welcome. My name is Mitra Ahatpur. I'm the deputy director of the Office of Translational Sciences. Good morning, I'm Electra Papadopoulos, and I lead the Clinical Outcome Assessment staff here in the Office of New Drugs. Good morning, I'm Michelle Tarver, and I am a medical officer in the Center for Di Devices, excuse me, in Radiological Health. My name is Elena Kustova, and I represent National Institute on Drug Abuse. Thank you very much. I also want to name my colleagues who are part of the planning team who have worked very hard to put this meeting together. We have Pujita Vaidya, Graham Thompson, Megana Chalasani, Shannon Woodward, Leela Lackey, Blake 
um, Bannister and Ariana Hughes. And so um, please, if there's anything you need, let us know. Um, if we have a name tag, we can help you out throughout the day. We have a full agenda for this day. Can everyone hear me? If anyone can't hear me, please raise your hand. OK. We have a full agenda for the day. Uh, can I go through the slides? It works now. OK. Um, uh, after Teresa sets some opening remarks, we'll have a bit of background. Um, but our background we um, is brief so that we can get to what the real purpose of the discussion today is to listen to individuals with opioid use disorder, as well as family members and advocates. Uh, so we will have two discussion topics. One will focus on health effects of opioid use disorder, and then we'll have a lunch, and then we'll come back and have a topic on treatment approaches. Um, there is um, time set aside for what we call open public comment later this afternoon. So while the primary purpose of our discussion throughout the day is to hear from individuals, families, and, and advocates about the topics that we have on the table today, we do recognize that, that there may be others who want to provide a comment or that you in the room may have a comment on a different topic that you'd like to provide. So if you want to participate in that open public comment, there's a registration um, sign-up form at our registration table. Uh, participation is first come, first serve. And uh, we'll close the registration at the end of the, of the break. Uh, the time allotted for each speaker will be two minutes for that. Okay. Uh, lunch is an important topic. Our, our, um, one of the um, uh, patient advocacy groups, Addiction Policy Forum, has um, kindly offered lunch for people who are not federal, so for people who are individuals, family members, and, uh, um, and, and others. Uh, there is, so um, I believe they'll have that set up in the hallway. There's also a kiosk at the, um, at the, behind this room where you can pre-order a lunch uh, for purchase. Um, and we suggest do pre-order that um, and at, at a break um, or, or during the discussion sometime find a time to go out and, and do that. Um, if you would like to buy a lunch. OK. We ask you to please silence your phones. This meeting is being audio um, recorded. We, so we are streaming a live audio recording of the meeting. And that will have the presentation slides. Um, so for you in the webcast, um, if you're participating, your participation is extremely important. We value your input. We will have every chance for you to participate. You can't see in the room, but I am looking out at a room that is packed um, with people here to, to share their experiences. So just know that even if you can't see. Um, the audio recording and the slides, along with the meeting transcript and a summary report, will be made publicly available after the meeting. And because of the sensitive nature of this meeting topic, and the importance of gathering candid, meaningful input from individuals who have come forward courageously to speak about living with opioid use disorder. No other audio recording, video recording, or photography will be allowed at this patient-focused drug development meeting. That means cell phones as well. So please um, keep your, your cameras um, quiet today. We ask for your co cooperation and strongly request that you respect the privacy of all individuals. If we see anyone recording or taking photos, we will ask you to stop. And if participants do not comply with this request, we will need to um, stop the meeting. So we very much um, ask for your respect of the people who have courageously attended this meeting. With that, I would like to turn it to Teresa for some opening remarks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and again, good morning and uh, welcome to this meeting. We are very, very happy to have so many uh, individuals and uh, family members and advocates here in the room with us today. And we know that many more are joining us uh, remotely on our webcast. And we're thank we want to thank you very much for making the time to come here today and to share with us and, and, and help us understand better kind of what you're experiencing and that we can, we can learn and do better by knowing that directly. Uh, we're also very happy to uh, uh, have uh, you join us if you're here from other stakeholder groups, if you're here from industry and you want to understand what patients 
are, are experiencing directly. Um, we, uh, we want to learn more about what the impact of uh, opioid use disorder is for you on your life, um, you know, what uh, experiences you've had, the challenges that you had accessing treatments, your experience with treatment. Uh, we understand that opioid use disorder is a very serious condition with physical, emotional, and social impacts, that this is a big unmet need for patients. And uh, we are responsible in our work for weighing the benefits and risks of drugs that uh, companies want to market to patients. And so our getting a better understanding from you of what it's like to live with this condition will help us in doing that kind of assessment and helping us figure out how to encourage the best and most effective drug development uh, in this area to help treat people who are experiencing opioid use disorder. Um, I also want to thank and acknowledge that we have a lot of representatives, as I said, from industry, other government partners. I especially want to thank our NIDA colleagues for their great help in making this meeting so well attended. Their outreach and, and planning with us are going to ensure our success today in trying to hear as much as we can from as many of you as we can. Um, and uh, the other partners and others who've come here today to hear uh, what, what uh, experiences people have had. You know, FDA plays a critical role, in, but we're not the only player in uh, de drug development. And, and so it's important that we see this high level of interest that we have to hear today in the room. And I'm going to just go over a few slides that we have here. Uh, you hear us using this term, patient-focused drug development. I'm just going to spend a minute to talk about what do we mean by that, OK? Well, part of FDA's mission, we, we regulate a lot of things, but it includes drugs. And part of that job is for us to ensure that a drug that a company wants to market is safe and effective for the use that the company wants to put out there. And so how do we do that? Well, we, we, take, we, we are very systematic in how we look at these drugs. And we need to make sure that the benefits outweigh the risks. So we look at how bad is the condition that people are experiencing? Um, are, there other, are there drugs available that are really taking care of it? Are they meeting their needs? You know, how does this drug, what benefits does it offer? What are the risks? Could we manage the risk somehow so the benefit outweighs the risk? You know, that's what we have to look at. And what we find is that people who have the condition are really like uniquely positioned to tell us what it's like to live with that disease. How bad is it? How well do the drugs that are available work? So they really help us to understand those first two areas of unmet need and severity of the condition. More than the literature or doctors treating the patients, patients directly can tell you things nobody else can say. So that's really what we understand better now. And we've been trying to systematically collect this kind of information from people who have different diseases. And we're learning a lot every time we do this. And we've been calling it patient-focused drug development. Here's a list, just as you can see, over the past five years, we've, we've been trying to ask questions like this for people with a variety of different diseases which don't have good treatments today, and you know people are suffering and dying, and, 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 and they can tell us what it's like in ways that help us be better about making that assessment process and give better advice to companies who are trying to develop drugs to treat those conditions. So what we've been learning is people who have the condition are experts in what it's like to live with the condition. This is an industry, like the drug industry and, and medical product industry, you know, they consult with experts all the time, right? But what we realize now is patients and, and individuals who are living with a condition, they are experts. So hearing from them, we'll also hear what's not being captured in those development programs. What are we not looking at that we should be because those people are experiencing these things? And that's really, we've learned a lot. We've learned sometimes with a progressive condition, people would just like you to, a good treatment would just stop the condition from progressing any further. In some cases, that's a relevant kind of benefit that they'd like to have. We also understand from hearing from people, lots of times, people want to participate and help however they can. You know, there are limits to how much people who have a condition can help, but they want to help as much as they can. So you're helping us enormously today by being here in this meeting and being on this webcast because you're going to help us better understand and we're going to make better and wiser decisions as a result. So thank you again for, for joining us here today. And uh, just one more thing I'll mention is that, you know, uh, one of the things we've been looking at as we've been trying to uh, figure out what can we do to help with um, people who are uh, living with opioid use disorder is also um, people have asked, well, how can you help more with people who are living with chronic pain? 
And so this is another condition. And so in mid-July, on July 9th, we're now, we're going to plan a meeting, and we'll have more information about it in the future. But that meeting is going to focus on obtaining the perspectives of people who are living with chronic pain, and how's that like, what for that, how, what's that life like for them, and what is their experience with using drugs that are available to treat chronic pain, and, and how much more can be done there. So that's a similar kind of a engagement, but with people who have chronic pain, and we're planning for the future. And with that, I just want to thank you again for being here today. Um, we're, we're very uh, much looking forward to hearing what you, you're going to be able to tell us. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Miriam. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Miriam Afshar. Uh, I'm a re medical reviewer in division of better, um, in the division of anesthesia, analgesia, and addiction products. Given the diversity of understanding of the opioid use disorders, I'm going to provide a brief overview um, of the diagnosis, the impact of the disease, and currently available treatment options. The slides you will see contain more information than what we can cover in 10 minutes, but they will be available on FDA website for um, your reference. I would like to first go over some general definitions and then talk about the um, definition of opioid use disorder. Opioids are a class of drugs that include heroin, uh, opioid pain medication, and synthetic uh, opioids such as fentanyl. Drug abuse is using a drug not as it was prescribed or a substance in order to experience psychological or physical effects. Tolerance is needing to use more of a substance to get the desired effect or experiencing a weaker effect when using the same amount. Withdrawal is experiencing psychological signs such as irritability or physical signs such as cramps or flu-like symptoms when not using a drug or using a drug to avoid symptoms of uh, withdrawal. Dependence can be physical or psychological. By physical dependence, we mean that if the drug is decreased or stopped, the individual will experience withdrawal symptoms. Psychological dependence is when the individual has lost control over drug use or experiences psychological distress if not able to use. This corresponds to the familiar term addiction. The currently used medical term is opioid use disorder. Over the years, some of the terms that we have been using have changed. The Diagnostic and, Substance, uh, and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorder, or DSM-4, that was published in 1994, had uh, opioid use disorder categorized under two groups, opioid abuse and opioid dependence. The criteria for opioid abuse was one or more symptoms of social problems due to opioid use or risky use. The criteria for opioid dependence was three or more symptoms, including tolerance and or withdrawal symptoms. Almost 20 years later, according to DSM-5, opioid use disorder is now a single diagnosis with different severities based on the number of symptoms that are present. The signs are categorized into four groups, loss of control, risky use, social problems, and drug effects. Examples for loss of control are using more than intended, spending a lot of time obtaining, using, or recovering from the effects of the drug, a strong urge to use, repeated attempts to stop or cut down. Risky use is using opioids when it, is, um, it can be physically dangerous to use, or continuing to use despite experiencing physical or psychological problems. Symptoms of uh, social impairment are like not being able to take care of responsibilities at work, school, or home because of opioid use, using opioid despite problems in relationships, and not attending to social or recreational activities because of opioid use. Drug effects are tolerance and withdrawal, which we just talked about. 
opiate use disorder can be diagnosed when two of 11 symptoms are present in a 12-month period. Mild opioid use disorder can be diagnosed with two to three symptoms. But it's important to note that if those two symptoms are withdrawal and tolerance, that doesn't qualify for a diagnosis if the individual is taking opioid pain medication as directed. Patients who are on pain medication can develop tolerance. And if the medication is stopped, they can experience withdrawal symptoms. But that does not mean that they have opioid use disorder. Moderate to severe opioid use disorder corresponds roughly to what we think of as opioid dependence or addiction and can benefit from medication treatment. Based on a 2016 national survey on drug use and health, almost 12 million individuals had opioid misuse, and over 2 million people were diagnosed with opioid use disorder. As you can see, different surveys use different terms, such as misuse. But the bottom line is that lots of people are affected by opioid use disorder. This is a multifaceted problem affecting many aspects of the individual's lives, including medical and psychological problems, social and uh, financial problems, even overdose and premature death. Treatment is categorized in two main groups, behavioral and medication treatment. This is not an exhaustive list of behavioral treatments, but some include cognitive behavioral therapy and peer support groups. The currently available medication treatments are categorized based on the mechanism of action and includes agonist, antagonist, and partial agonist. Methadone is an agonist, meaning it activates the opioid receptors. It has been available since the early 1970s through federally certified opioid treatment programs, or OTPs. Individuals in uh, OTP will have counseling and regular urine drug screens and initially must show up daily to receive their dose. Methadone comes in different forms, liquid, powder, discus, and tablet. The tablet form is mainly used in pain management. Like any other medication, there are side effects with methadone. It can cause cardiac arrhythmia, it can also cause drug-drug interactions with other medications. If used with alcohol and benzodiazepine, there is a higher risk of respiratory depression, and there is also a higher risk of overdose when the treatment is stopped. Naltrexone is an antagonist, meaning it blocks the opioid receptors. The extended release form is a monthly intramuscular injection that can be given by the patient's healthcare provider uh, which can improve access. Before starting the injection, the individual must be opioid-free seven to 14 days, depending on the type of the opioid that they have been using. Otherwise, it can cause significant withdrawal symptoms. Naltrexone also can cause injection site reaction, and there is a risk of uh, overdose after stopping the treatment because of loss of tolerance. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist meaning it activates opioid receptors, but it does so to a certain limit. It is prescribed by healthcare providers who receive special training and its office space to improve access. The oral form has been available since 2002. It comes as tablet and film and is absorbed through the lining of the mouth. A six-month implant was approved in 2016, and most recently, a monthly injection was approved in 2017. There is risk of overdose after stopping the treatment and also if it's used with alcohol and uh, or benzodiazepines. We know medication treatment reduces relapse, improves retention in treatment, and decreases drug use, while stopping treatment increases the risk of overdose. With, with treatment, some patients will stop drug use completely and some will use less. Opioid use disorder is not simply the use of opioids, but also functional and or clinical problems due to opioid use. Even though opioid use is characterized by problems due to opioid use, the outcome of treatment has been assessed by looking at the drug use 
behavior and not the problems and uh, consequences. Because drug use behavior is not a direct measure of how the individual is um, doing clinically, meaning how they are feeling or functioning, it is considered a surrogate endpoint. One thing we are here to understand is what other ways individuals decide whether a treatment is working for them. So we can use that in understanding whether or not a new treatment is working. What brings individuals into treatment? What do individuals, families, and clinicians consider treatment success? How do we determine if treatment is successful? Answers to these questions will help us better assess treatment uh, options from a regulatory perspective. We are looking forward to your comments. Thank you. Good morning. Again, I'm Electra Papadopoulos, and I lead the clinical outcome assessment staff here in CEDAR. Um, our staff serves as consultants to each of the therapeutic area review divisions on their clinical outcome assessments, including patient questionnaires to show clinical benefit in drug development. So where do we go from our patient-focused drug development meetings? What do we do with this wealth of very important information um, that we obtain um, during these meetings? And I hope to be able to answer some of these questions in the next few slides. So patient-focused drug development meetings are a really important opportunity for us to hear from the patients in their own words um, how, what symptoms and impacts matter to them most, what they value in treatment, and also what amount of change in these impacts uh, would be meaningful in their daily lives. Um, drug companies can also benefit from the information that we obtain um, when they're going about selecting what to measure in their drug development programs, as well as um, the FDA where we can actually confirm whether the outcome assessments that we use truly capture, truly and faithfully capture um, the patient's um, uh, priorities. Now, importantly, these meetings are a starting point uh, for selecting and developing patient questionnaires and other types of um, clinical outcome assessments that we use in clinical trials to show benefits of drugs. We strongly recommend that there be further input from patients in the form of qualitative research, and this includes uh, in-depth patient interviews and focus groups, really using rigorous scientific methods. Now, what is a clinical study endpoint? The term endpoint refers to how a specific outcome will be measured and analyzed in a clinical study. So for example, an endpoint might be a change in a symptom score um, using a specific questionnaire, say at six weeks, um, compared with baseline. And so um, this is really important to understand when we're trying to assess clinical benefit. So anytime you read a scientific publication or you're trying to understand um, the benefit in, in, in drug labeling, um, this is important to understand. Now we're going to hear a lot of very important um, concerns that you have expressed at this meeting. And I want to say that not everything that is important will lend itself to measurement as a clinical endpoint in, in our uh, trials. So some things that might come out of this meeting could be extremely important. Say, um, as an example, the impact of health on patients' finances. Extremely important, but not really um, able to show change and really demonstrate a drug effect within the context of a clinical trial.
So um, here at FDA, we have to uphold um, our rules and regulations and our laws. And within our regulations are the requirement that our study endpoints need to be well-defined and reliable. And so what do we mean by this? Um, essentially, what we mean is that we have evidence that the assessment is measuring the right thing, um, which we call the concept, in the right way, in a defined population of patients, and that the score can accurately and reliably quantify changes that can be interpreted as a clear benefit to patients. So the tool needs to be able to detect change. Um, it's important to know that a lot of questionnaires that we might fill out in our doctor's offices may or may not be appropriate for use in clinical trials. And so we need to evaluate those through the specific lens of uh, clinical trial endpoints and what is really fit for purpose. It's a specific purpose. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to say also that um, endpoint development can be a lengthy and expensive process. And I think this really provides an important opportunity for patient groups and stakeholders to come together um, and support this process outside the context of specific drug development programs so that at the end of the day, we can have tools that are publicly available and can be used across drug development more broadly. So some key takeaways, the outcomes of the patient-focused drug development meetings will really support and guide um, FDA risk-benefit assessments and drug reviews by helping us to understand what symptoms and impacts are important to patients and what they value in treatment. The information from patients and caregivers ultimately will help us to determine what to measure to provide evidence of clinical benefit, how best to measure the important symptoms and impacts, and how much change in those impacts is meaningful to patients. So in closing, many stakeholders, including drug developers, researchers, clinicians, patient stakeholders, can play an important role in developing clinical outcome assessments, including things like patient questionnaires. And there are multiple pathways um, by which these stakeholders can engage with the FDA. Um, my final slide will show some uh, web links um, alluding to some of these pathways. And finally, patient-focused drug development meetings are the starting point for developing patient-focused outcome measures and endpoints. And with that, um, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I'm back. Again, Sarah Eggers. I hope that those um, background presentations gave you a sense, if you're new to um, this area of what FDA does and what drug development is, then I hope it gave you a little bit of background um, on that, and, and especially some of the key terms and words we'll be using today. So thank you very much for that. I am now going to kick off what is the main feature of today's discussion. And I'm going to also, before saying that, you know, feel free to at any point get up, stretch your legs. If you are meaning to um, purchase, pre-purchase a lunch from the kiosk, if you're, especially if you're a federal worker and you need to, to do that, please do so. The restrooms, um, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, they're located um, behind this building and then off um, in a hallway to the right, you'll find the restrooms there. But please, this is an open, um, as much as we can make a, a federal agency be welcoming, we are trying to, so get up and, and, and walk around, please stay. Okay, we've been talking about this. There are two main topics we want to cover today. I know there's a lot of words on, on these slides, but the first topic that will be in the morning is really what's it like to live with opioid use disorder and in particular the health effects and the daily impacts, how it affects, how opioid use disorder affects day-to-day -day life. 
life on the best days and the worst days and how it's changed over time and what worries you most. And then when we come back after lunch in the afternoon, it's really on current approaches to treatment of opioid use disorder, your experiences and your perspectives on that, what you would like to see in an ideal treatment. If future treatments could be better, how could they be better? And what factors would you consider if you um, would ever consider participating in a clinical trial? Clinical trials are very important to drug development, and so we would like to know your thinking on those as well. So here's how it works. For each of these two discussions, we're going to kick off our discussion with comments from a panel of individuals with o OUD. And I'm going to ask um, Andrew and Amanda to come up um, at this point. We have two other um, participants who are participating on the phone. We are going to try to do as much as we can um, going to the to the people on the webcast, and um, we're also using the phone as much as we can today. So the purpose of the panelists is just to give a story uh, of an experience with um, opioid use disorder that will help us kick off a discussion with all of you um, who identify as individuals with OUD, o opioid use disorder, or opio opioid addiction, family members, and advocates. Um, and so it's, I'll be coming out in the front with a microphone, and we're going to have um, my colleagues have microphones, and they will come to you. So if, if, it's, if you have something to say, raise your hand. We are going to try to get to as many people in the room as we can. There's a couple things that help us. One is if you stay, whatever topic we're talking about, if we're talking about symptoms or if we're talking about daily impact, to, to try to think about what that topic is and stay as close to that topic and try to keep your points to just maybe one or two things so that we can go on to as many people who want to speak as possible. When speaking, you may remain anonymous, meaning you don't have to give us your names. You may state your names if you want, but we don't care what your name is, we care what your experience is, and so that's what's important. Same if you're on the webcast or if you're calling in on the phone. Okay. Now, You'll see these funny little disks on your tables. This is to give us a chance to do something we call polling questions. And you can, we, we encourage you to participate um, if you are um, an individual or family member. Uh, they really aid our discussion because we can't get, can't, no one can speak on, on everything. And so you have a chance to raise your hand in some ways by answering polling questions. So you'll use these clickers and can everyone, Click their clicker and just see that it buzzes. It should feel a little buzz. All buzzing. If no one, if something doesn't buzz, raise your hand and we'll come with a new clicker. I hear that their battery life is getting to about the point where we need new batteries on some. Okay, so um, we're going to ask for individuals or family members um, only, uh, please. Um, and web participants, there's a chance for you to use your computer to answer these questions too. Web participants. Please type in. You aren't here to be in person to lend your voice, but we want to hear your comments on the web. Don't worry about us being overwhelmed by comments. We can handle it. We'll try to summarize them as much as possible. We will occasionally, as time permits, go to the phones to give you another opportunity. Again, please, if you're participating on the phone, keep it to one or two things that are on the topic we're discussing. You can send us your comments, too. We have a website. Um, it's called a public docket through the Federal Register, um, which is just the way that people in the real world can talk to people at FDA. Uh, it's open until June 18th, so you have two months for you to comment on something. If something really was interesting, you got more to say, you can send it in. Or if you have friends, loved ones, others who you think have something to say, you can um, encourage them. Anyone is welcome to comment, so you don't have to be an individual or family member. But I'm going to tell you, you can submit as anonymous, and I want you to keep in mind that if you submit to the public docket, that is, the word public is there for a reason. This will go on the, on the website. So please think about how much personal information you want to share, um, and we don't need your personal information. Again, we don't care who, what your name is, or where you live, we care about what your experience is. So um, keep that in mind. And, and so by, you can just say anonymous, anonymous, or just leave the blank parts for what, when they ask what your name is. Okay. 
So here's how you do it. You can go to this website and click now. And if you go to our web page, um, we hopefully have simplified things a bit as much as we can. Okay, there's a few rules that are very important to go through, and I say these with all seriousness um, ab about this meeting today. We want to hear from individuals and family members, and we really hope that we have made this as welcoming as possible so you feel comfortable lending your voices. Um, advocates. Uh, we have a lot of individuals in the room, and so advocates, we're going to ask you to kind of to, to play it by ear. If you're an advocate and you wear many, we all wear many hats, if you also have personal experiences, please put that hat on and speak from your personal experiences living with OUB or having a family member. Um, everyone else is here to listen. That means FDA and, and our colleagues from NIDA, they might have some follow-up questions. You might have questions for us, and we may not be able to answer all of them, but we are noting all of your questions. And if you come up to us individually, we can take your information and try to answer your question individually, even if we can't answer them all today. Uh, if you're here from a drug developer or a healthcare provider or um, other interested person, we ask you to just stay in listening mode. Remember that open public comment at the end of the day is where you can comment on other topics. The views to express today are personal opinions. They're not just opinions, they're our personal stories, and everyone has their own story and their own perspectives, and we respect that. Respect for one another is paramount. Um, we will have differing views on things today and differing experiences, and we will listen to it respectfully. We will not spend too much time on any one given perspective, so we will be moving, moving along. Um, our discussion is going to focus on health effects and treatments. We know that this is a very complicated um, issue, and there are many, there are many concerns and many things that um, questions you have and, and things you have to think about about living um, with OUD and and getting the support you needed. Those are all important. Um, we will be focusing though on health effects and impacts and treatments. Again. There's the docket to, um, you know, you can send us comments through the website uh, for, for other things. Okay. Again, for the respect of our participants who are showing great courage in coming here today, no audio recording, video recording, or photography. And please complete evaluation form. We have done 25 meetings that are sort of, that are very similar to this. We learn from every single one of them, and so your feedback is important. Okay. So with that said, I'm going to ask you to get your clickers out. Advocates, you can answer the first clicker questions, the first couple quick clicker questions too, and I'll, and I'll um, then ask you to put them down after a few minutes. So, so here's how the, I will read the questions out because it can sometimes be wordy. And as you feel comfortable, you're going to click whatever letter I say for that. So where do you live? Do you live in the D.C. area, metropolitan area, including Virginia and Maryland suburbs? I'm going to guess Baltimore. You don't consider yourself a suburb of D.C., so you don't have to answer within Washington, D.C. So if you live within D.C., A. And if you live outside of D.C., B. And I don't see any responses happening. Um, so, has anyone, someone's clicked, right? Okay, so let's see. Okay. Um, all right, you know what? We will come back to, okay, hold, let's, okay, so we're going to skip the first one. That was, okay, okay, oh, we can do it, okay. Try again. We learn from every meeting. Uh, where do you live? Inside D.C. or outside of D.C.? You'll click B. Let's see if we're getting... I'm not seeing any responses. Is it thinking? What? No. Okay. You know what we're going to do? We are going to skip on the polling questions. We have a lot of ground we want to cover. We will come back to those if if we can get them up. And um, remember, this is a this is a federal government agency, so sometimes our technology is. So let's start with our panel commenters. Just don't pay any attention to the screens. 
So we have two in person and two over the phone. And I'm going to, and again, they are going to share their stories to kick off our discussion. So I'm going to ask Andrew to start. They prepared about three minutes of comments. And Andrew, click the um, red button. Bring that microphone as close as you can. And they'll, you guys will let us know if you can't hear. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. So my name is Andrew Kazoulis, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. And for you, that means, uh, first and foremost, as that mom has her son back. Um, and I, uh, I literally still can't even write that without almost crying. Um, our family uh, continues to heal, uh, and I've come to understand that where you find uh, recovering people, you find recovering families, you find recovering communities as well. Um, Mom's not the only one that benefits uh, in, in the family. Um, I'm also a grad student at the University of Southern Maine where I'm pursuing a master's degree in uh, policy planning and management after achieving a baccalaureate of chemistry uh, this past May. Um, while at USM, uh, I helped uh, co-found the uh, Recovery Oriented Campus Center, the ROC at USM. We are rock stars uh, rocking our way to college degrees. Uh, and the uh, first of eight uh, main chapters of Young People in Recovery, YPR. In 2007, however, I developed OUD under the care of a healthcare provider following a work-related back injury that would forever change my life. Nearly four years was spent in and out of physical therapy, undergoing two back surgeries that they don't even do anymore because they have been so unsuccessful. Often plagued with so much pain that I would sometimes have to actually crawl to the bathroom just to get there. Uh, I was quickly prescribed high doses of opiates. Um, once a high school uh, lacrosse captain and uh, three-time sports all-star uh, and collegiate football player. Um, I became restricted to the living room, essentially, uh, and became a slave to my OUD. My physicians, like many other physicians, were ill-equipped to prevent, identify, and or address OUD. There was no mention that the opiates also treat the emotional and mental trauma that goes along with an injury. Uh, and I had no idea that there was a component of that, a physical injury that changed my life. Uh, you know, I had an emotional shift and a mental shift, an emotional trauma and mental trauma. And then months into my OUD, I was abruptly cut off by my prescriber. Uh, with no discharge plan and no insight into other possible services, I experienced intense physical withdrawals, some of which were mentioned, um, which of course included diarrhea and vomiting. Um, what I was not expecting was the insomnia. Uh, I was unable to sleep, and additionally, um, the, the feeling of these bugs like crawling underneath my skin and chewing their way through my body. Uh, that was something that, uh, even if I was told about, I don't think I could have been prepared for. Um, and far worse were the intense emotional cravings. Um, without opiates, I was a failure, I was a loser in my head. Um, and I was a roller coaster of rage and, and depression in my heart. Um, I seemed just completely use, useless and, and worthless, uh, weak and pathetic, and uh, what a waste of time and space I was. That was kind of my internal monologue. Uh, again, I felt a prisoner in my own home and my own mind, and I was unable to leave either without the assistance of opiates. Please understand what I mean. Uh, with opiates, I was more physically able, sometimes mentally unstoppable, uh, and always, at a minimum, I was emotionally invincible. I was just unfazed by things. Uh, my best days were spent laughing and engaging and connecting with friends uh, and people in the community. Um, I would temporarily feel free uh, and desperately sought uh, that sense of security uh, in any way possible. Uh, the opiates indeed became my best friend and my partner. Um, and at that point, I'm not sure which you know, life someone would choose. Uh, you hear that term choice a lot, and which life would, would you choose uh, if you were faced with those two options? Logically, I turned to illicit avenues of uh, satisfying and supporting my physical, mental, and emotional cravings. I purchased illicit opiate drugs and developed a criminal lifestyle. Um, the only community uh, with which I actually felt welcomed, curiously, uh, and a part of, a real part of, 
a sense of community there. Um, I could not keep jobs or relationships, uh, and I became so desperate to find relief uh, from all this pain that I eventually turned to IV harem. Uh, my worst days included crimes that I am reluctant to uh, talk about here. I would maybe say them and then say I allegedly. <laughs> um, in short, um, the use and the lifestyle became incredibly traumatic in and of itself. Um, emotionally bankrupt and mentally exhausted, I came to a place where uh, the only thing resembling uh, relief came in not living. Um, unaware that I had developed a very, very severe uh, depression, along with OUD, I attempted suicide through uh, in intentional overdose. Um, what still certainly holds me in terror uh, is the idea of uh, needing further back surgeries, which is almost guaranteed with my condition. Uh, chronic pain is a huge part of my story. I do a lot of yoga and meditation and stretching to, uh, to manage that. Um, I certainly hope I can stay on the path of recovery and find effective non-opiate-based uh, pain medications. But uh, what most concerns me is the uh, discrimination and stigma that people with OUD face on a daily basis. Um, and I can tell you about, uh, you know, how I was chained to my past and told, you know, that my present defines, is defined by my past, i.e. the tail wags the dog. There's not a dog with a tail. The tail wags the dog. The wake steers the ship. Um, I think this is best summed up with a, an experience of a friend of mine, a colleague, um, who landed a, a fellowship at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Um, he literally went through an NSA clearance, full NSA clearance, had a, a badge that said Executive Office of the President, and he could not rent an apartment in, right here in D.C. Uh, because he's a person with felony drug conviction due to his OUD. Uh, he actually had to uh, pay someone, transfer money, a friend of a friend of a friend in California to sublet a room. Uh, and I think that kind of really <laughs> sums up in a very tangible way what, you know, some of the things we're dealing with. Uh, lack of prescriber and public education around OUD continues to prove very negatively impactful on the lives of millions of Americans. Uh, fortunately, I am just one of millions of pretty awesome and incredible and inspiring recovery stories uh, which I really hope that we can elevate and celebrate. Uh, and I beg of you in this room to identify as recovery allies, uh, if you're not personally in recovery, to your, your family, to your friends, uh, and in your communities to help raise those stories and elevate those, that, that inspiration and that hope because it's happening all over the place. Um, again, uh, I'd like to uh, strongly support the FDA's recent initiatives. Uh, related to OUD and, and hope that the patient perspective continues to be well represented. Uh, and I appreciate your consideration of my experience and um, offer myself uh, for any questions that anyone might have here or, or later. And thank you very, very much. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> we'll save questions for now, but then we'll have the um, facilitated discussion. Uh, I'm going to see is, if we can have Pamela on the phone. Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hi, Pamela. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Hi, everyone. I am a person also in long-term recovery from opiate dependency. Uh, when opiate dependent, opiate use disorder drove my daily activities, as I would be drug sick if I didn't first attend to my opiate dependency. Opiates do not cause confusion if you're taking an appropriate amount. Most opiate addicts don't use excessively because they know they have to have a continual supply of opiates or they're going to be sick. So you don't ever have extra. Extra is a foreign concept in terms of opiate use disorder. The effects of opiate withdrawal were insurmountable. I could not function in my home life or work life if I was in withdrawal. I threw up a lot and then got very dehydrated and was usually requiring a hospital stay to withdraw toward the end. I remember once trying to stop using opiates while living and working in Paris. I presented at an ER and they quickly whisked me off to a cardiac unit, reminding me that I had heart valve problems from having been an injector for so long. I craved opiates and tried to use before work and after work only, but sometimes would use at lunch or would sneak around to different floors bathrooms to inject within my workplace. When someone has an opiate dependency such that they are going to be drug sick when they don't use, nothing will take precedence over finding some opiates to get unsick. 
Once I'm sick, I could perform my job responsibilities and my daily living activities. I had minimal relationships with my family members when I was opiate dependent because they did not approve of my heroin use. They were not mean, but I was ashamed and could not stop, although I wanted to. I decided I would rather die than continue to live a slave to addiction, so I attempted suicide, obviously unsuccessfully. <laughs> I had a lot of medical problems from my injecting heroin and cocaine. I was diagnosed with a level 4 staph infection and could not walk from sepsis in my knees and back. I had an abscess that had floated to my spine, which was also very painful. Because doctors were fearful I would use a PICC line for drugs, they would not put one in to administer the IV antibiotics that I needed. I also had no insurance at the time, so that may have been why they wouldn't put in a PICC line. They kept having to redo peripheral sites to administer the IV antibiotics, which was difficult because of how heavily vena-compromised I am. It took me a long time to get rid of the MRSA completely. I had stopped using and got a mosquito bite, which turned into a MRSA abscess. I had an ingrown hair, which also turned into an MRSA abscess. I am a reasonably intelligent human being. I graduated University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, speak four languages, and hold a master's degree. However, nursing and medical staff often treated me as stupid because of ignorance about the emotional roots of this disease. Establishment needs to stop tying addiction to the intellectual realm. Addiction has nothing to do with intellect. If anything, strong intellect is a risk factor for the disease of addiction because people who are strong intellectually believe that they can outthink the disease of addiction, which you cannot. Last week, I went to the doctor for an annual physical. I was so excited and proud of the fact that she had no idea that I had been cocaine and opiate dependent. for nearly 30 years of my adult life. However, I have advocated doing the lab draws, or I'm sorry, however, I have avoided doing the lab draws that they required because I know that once I go to the lab and they can't draw blood out of my arms, 15 years into recovery, I will then be treated completely differently as an addict. I now am a person in long-term recovery, and it took me nearly 30 years to get 15 consistent years away from cocaine and opiate use. I am one of the most fortunate. I have a loving family and a mother that never gave up. I, get, I come from privilege, education, and resources, and I was therefore empowered enough to find harm reduction early on, 1994, and believe that the changes in thinking that harm reduction programming provided me were essential to my long-term success in overcoming a traumatic and chaotic addiction to opiates and cocaine. I have broken the generational cycle of chemi chemical dependency in my family. Both my father and grandfather used alcohol. What worries me most about my condition now is the fact that my children are living with the effects of heavily altered genes. I didn't realize that by waiting to have children when I was fairly confident that I was finished using, I was then giving my children genes that had been heavily impacted by my very heavy drug use. The cocaine did the most damage, I believe. I also worry about how much stress I put on my heart with the years of heavy cocaine injection. I worry most about my children being discrim discriminated against if people where we live were to know my true addiction history. Thank you again for your time today and for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Pamela. You um, can't see us, but there have been, you've got a lot of, of head noddings and, and just um, uh, reactions that mean that people know what you're what you're talking about in the story you're sharing so thank you before we let Pamela off the phone I just want to see if there's any clarifying questions from our FDA experts okay all right then Pamela thank you so much again you can participate through the webcast um, and we hope that you keep that you keep commenting that was a very um, a very powerful um, story thank you uh, thank you Okay, now we're going to go back into the room, and we will have Amanda. So bring that mic as close as you can. I go. think I'm good. Oh, okay. pretty loud. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Amanda. I'm a peer recovery outreach worker for Baltimore County Department of Health Bureau of Behavioral Health. I'm also a person in long-term recovery from opioid use disorder. 
And I am living with and the caretaker of a person with chronic pain that has now begun to acknowledge that they have an opioid use disorder as well. Um, I started using opioids when I was about 16 years old. I was prescribed them for a wisdom tooth removal. And there were a lot of medications in my house, and it used. It started off purely recreationally. By the time I went to college, I was a weekend partier. Um, I would say first year of college, it became a daily thing. Um, after a bad relationship, I moved from simply using prescription opioids to being an active IV drug user. I had convinced myself that I was the safest IV drug user you have ever seen in your life. I had been able to swindle Sam's Club into giving me those giant boxes of needles. I never used the same needle twice. I had a pill filter. I understood the uses of Narcan and Naloxone, and I kept them, and I always used with a buddy. And that made me feel like I had it completely under control. Um, I did have gate shots, so I knew exactly how much I needed in order to function. I was using pharmaceutical pain medication as well as heroin at the same time. I also was using uh, benzos on muscle relaxants. Um, most of those medications were used when I wasn't able to get a hold of an opioid and I wanted to be able to manage my withdrawal and continue going to school and work, which I was doing full time. My bad decisions buddy decided to go pick up with me, and the person that she used heroin with first had just come back from rehab. The person did not have any money um, and was willing to do things in order to get heroin that I was not comfortable with. And as I was watching the car of that transaction happen, I realized that I didn't know how long it was going to be until I decided that that was something I was willing to do. I went home, I used, I called my parents, and that was it. My parents knew that something was going on. I don't think that they thought it was opioid dependency. I believe they thought it was probably alcohol and marijuana. And I feel that they had gotten a hint within the past six months that a good quantity of my prescription medication was coming from my parents' house. I went into treatment, I detoxed, um, and I decided that the only way that I was going to survive was if I was extremely open and public about my substance use and my recovery from the very beginning. I was open and public about the fact that I had gone into treatment. I was open and public about the fact that I was an IOP. I was open with my employer as to why I needed to change my work schedule. Um, so I've never lived anonymously. It took a very long time for the person that I care for to recognize the similarities between my story and their story. It was, it, I would say it was within the past six months. And it was through the conversation of preparing to come here that they were actually able to sit down and look at what was being on these opioids costing. They are on an intrathecal spinal morphine pump in addition to oral medication. The pump has been wonderful and when there is no crisis, very little oral medication is taken. The oral medication that they take is counterindicated to the opioids though. It's a lot of muscle relaxers and benzos. When it's bad, <coughs> It's very bad. Um, when the pump isn't enough, when the medication needs to be increased, when we're in the emergency room and they're in full crisis, um, they experience full body muscle spasms. For all of you out there, if you've had a Charlie horse, now imagine your whole body is Charlie horsing simultaneously at the same time. And it does not stop. We've let them go for four and a half hours. Then you're watching someone scream for four and a half hours. The new thing that's happened over the past couple of years is that they will actually pass out and stop breathing, which is great because we can straighten them out. It's bad because they're not breathing. They will come back um, around, take that deep breath like they're coming out of water, and then seize up again. Large amounts of medication is now needed in order to get those spasms under control because of the tolerance that has built up from years of opioid use. 
Um, the fear that I have is what happens when I'm not strong enough to not go to the lockbox that I know I'm smart enough to crack and decide to use again? And what do I do if the reason why I'm using is because I'm experiencing the trauma of that person in the emergency room in crisis again? And what do I do when a hospital doesn't do what I know is needed to keep that person out of crisis because they've decided that that pump just magically makes pain disappear? That when they see the amount of medication that this person is on, that they don't need any more. And now I'm in the hospital for three weeks. And now I'm watching them scream. It's a vicious cycle. And hearing that person finally admit that being stuck in that vicious cycle of pain has a lot to do with why so much medication is needed. Hearing them say that what happens when the body's tolerance level finally breaks and they just OD. What do we do when that happens and that pump is running and we have no ability to turn it off? What do we do when the pump does stop working? Because we've watched that happen too. And the withdrawal is almost instant because you have a, a stream, a steady drip of morphine going into someone's spine. I've seen this person try to find the balance between managing pain, embracing a child with substance use disorder, and being strong enough to do what's needed, to do the biofeedback treatment, to do the counseling that's necessary, to constantly be talking to doctors about their condition and find a way to be the best patient advocate they can. And sometimes that means sitting in an ER and saying, yes, you can try that one milligram of Dilaudid and know it will do nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And now we're going to go back to the phone and have um, Jody. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Jody. <laughs> okay. Am I uh, loud enough? Or? You you are, and you've got um, a lot of people here um, welcoming your comments. Great. Okay. Good morning. My interest in this comic comments. Um, today in this topic might be a little bit unique in that it stems from three different viewpoints. One is as an opioid user myself, um, sometimes scared, angry, confused um, about the treatment I receive as a patient um, in today's climate, being told I need to get off the opioids that I've taken for years as a way to treat my pain and other symptoms, but not given an alternative and left to deal with not only the pain, but now also the withdrawal. Um, added to this is suddenly trying to come to terms with hearing things like, I'm an addict and an abuser, and the disrespect that goes with it when I have been more familiar with people describing me instead as a go-getter and a professional in other terms. Um, second is also as an opioid user, but this point of view is one is um, someone who's often worried that I might be the next one to unwittingly take a lethal combination of prescribed medications or prescribed meds with something like, you know, for a cold and not wake up the next morning and becoming the next statistic. Um, the third point of view is as the mother of a child who became an addict after being treated with opioids following an automobile accident. Um, she hid her addiction from everyone except a couple of her co-addicted friends and went on to get married, have two children, get her master's degree, and in fact was working on her PhD when she died of an accidental overdose at the age of 37 after taking methadone and an opioid. She never asked those who loved her for help but she was finally looking for it. So I'm tired of the drugs taking away my stamina, making my speech slow, making everything foggy. I could sleep all day, I've gained weight, I've got a constant headache, and I never really want to do anything. I've got scabs from itching and scratching all the time. 
Um, but without the drugs, I can't treat the effects of my medical conditions. I can't perform the functions of my job because I'm unable to get through a, a lengthy meeting or make presentations. I can't go to the dentist, the eye surgeon, which I need to do on a monthly basis for a condition. I can't go to a movie or a concert, take my grandchildren to the zoo or take a long flight to see the ones that aren't local. My husband has to sleep in another room so at least one of us can get some rest. Um, I've begun tapering off my opioids um, on my own at the urging of my primary care physician, my pharmacist, um, my health insurance company, um, because everyone's making it more difficult to get the prescription, um, even though the prescribing specialists um, don't feel that they have a good pain management plan or any other drugs to replace it. Um, I've had some success doing this on my own. Um, for instance, one dosage was 75 milligrams daily that I was taken and are taking, excuse me, and now I'm down to 30 milligrams of that drug a week. Um, but sometimes I don't know if the unsettled feeling, the anxiety, the craving, the crawlings and other such things that I often have is from the opioid withdrawal or just from trying to deal with pain. Um, the feelings are there. I just don't know what's causing them more. Um, so now I, as a self-proclaimed control freak, am not only unable to control my pain, which drives me nuts, but I also can't control my pain control medication either. Um, it's controlling me. Um, the government regulations are controlling me. The pharmacies are controlling me. Some providers, everybody else is trying to drive my bus. And that's something that I've always, you know, really held close to my vest is being a control freak, trying to do it myself. So I'm hoping there's a way to work through this crisis um, providing respect to everybody who has so far been shown so much disrespect in all of this. We all need help to return to a stable, meaningful life. And I'm fearful that otherwise too many of us will choose no life instead of a life where we're left trying to navigate without adequate support and assistance where needed. Um, because it really does feel that helpless and that hopeless Thank you very much, Jody. Can we? <laughs> Had you finished your comments, Jody? You were. I. Okay, um, Jody, you couldn't you couldn't see us in here, but again, you had a lot of head nods. There are a lot of people who share similar experiences or perspectives as you do. Um, and I think we'll. Are were there any clarifying questions for Jody? Okay. Um, so can we give another round of applause for our panel members? Thanks. You can sit up here or you can go back to the table. Okay. Um, hopefully you heard some of your own experiences and perspectives um, shared in that. Can I have a, if you feel comfortable, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. So however you feel comfortable, whether you're a family member or an individual, or even an advocate um, speaking on behalf of others. Um, did you hear yourself? Yeah, okay, I'm getting head nods, so we'll take that as a, as a yes. We started a little bit late, so we're a little bit um, short on time. I'm going to do a time check at 12 o'clock. We might go a little bit over 12, because I think we can have lunch in, in 45. But again, if you need to go use the restroom, or any time get up, please do. We had some polling questions that we tried earlier. And so we're going to try them again. I think it should be working. So if you can get those clickers out. These are important to us. They're, please, if you're, um, um, if you're looking at the results of these polling questions, they are not a scientific survey in any way. We do not treat them as such. They're just a, a chance for us to get a sense of who's in the room and who's on the web. And so, it's a, and so this helps us understand 
where you're coming from literally and, and what your experiences are. So where do you live? You can get the clickers. And we'll try it again. If you live inside DC area A and outside the DC area B. I'm seeing the numbers go up. That's great. And if you're on the web, um, if you haven't taken the polling, then you should be able to do so too. Okay. All right, so I don't see the numbers go up anymore. Uh, so we can take this answer. Oh, that's a tricky button. I think I saw the majority of people were not from the DC area. So, okay, all right, okay. So before I before you click your buzzers on here, I'm gonna let me read through this, okay? So let's go back to the. Okay, so we thank you for traversing the Beltway. And for those of you who had to take the red line this morning, a special thank you. I, I heard there was a fire on the, on the red line. OK, so next question. OK, which statement best describes you? An individual who currently struggles or has struggled in the past with opioid use disorder or um, opioid addiction or abuse? A family member or caregiver of such an individual? Or an advocate for individuals who struggle with opioid addiction or abuse? If you wear two hats, I hope you feel comfortable that you can share that you are that it, an individual or family member. So you have, can only choose one. So if you wear two, um, think about choosing A or B. Question. This is not going to be as accurate. This only captured some of the responses. OK. All right. Well, let me just make a point here. I mean, there are a lot of individuals struggling with opioid abuse and addiction in person and on the phone. And you are, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Um, we also have family members and um, people who are advocates. So let's move on. Okay. Now, from now on, I want you to think about yourself or that loved one who has opioid use disorder, one person. So advocates, um, if you only wear that um, hat, then please don't answer these questions. I want you to think of one person, yourself or someone else, and how old. Um, what is your age? A, younger than 18. B, if you're in the if you're in the 18 to 29. C, if you're in 30 to 39. D, if you're in the your 40s. E, if you're in your 50s. And C, if you're 60s or or better. F. Yeah, sorry. Okay, let's let's go on, see what we get. Okay, okay. Okay. Okay, we don't have we don't have kids represented in in the room. Hopefully um, uh, if there are um, parents or or adolescents um, on the webcast and you can um, write in. But otherwise it, it shows that um, that opioid use disorder doesn't care how old or young you are, uh, and so we we have a, a, a spectrum here. Okay, let's let's move on. We'll get all the web in in a second. Okay, so that that's fine. Okay. <laughs> so, do you or your loved one identify as male A, a, a female? Sorry, female A, B male, or C other? And if we have, um, you know, a, a mix here. Let's move on. Okay, how long has it been since you or your loved one first started using opioids of any kind? Or can, okay, now start clicking. A, less than five years ago. B, five to ten years ago. C, 11 to 20 years ago. 
D, 20 to 30 years ago, E, more than 30 years ago, or F, you're not sure. And exact numbers don't matter. <laughs> Just trying to get a sense. We have a range of experiences here and in years um, um, living with this um, with this condition. Okay, I think, is that the last polling question? One more, okay. Have you or your loved one ever been diagnosed by a healthcare professional as having an opioid use disorder or addiction? What this shows, we have 75% of, of you in the room have been diagnosed. Um, there's 25% who have not been um, part of the healthcare system for opioid use disorder, have not been diagnosed for addiction in the room. Can we have a summary of what's on? OK, we have one more polling question. Sorry. There's supposed to be a break in between some of these, so OK. OK, have you or your loved one ever had the following conditions? Acute pain for which a medical treatment was sought. This would be something, um, uh, broken bones, dental work, post-surgery. I think Amanda, that's um, right. Chronic pain, neuropathic pain, cancer, post-traumatic. C, other substance use disorder, alcohol, amphetamine, amphetamines, cocaine, hallucinogens. D, psychiatric or mental health conditions, depression, anxiety, mood disorders, or others. Or E, health, other health conditions that you think are relevant uh, to, to what we're talking about today. You can do more than one. All that, all that apply. While we're, doing, while we're waiting for that, can we have a summary of what's on the web? Um, yeah, we have about 65% saying acute pain um, for medical treatment, 37% chronic pain, 45% um, other substance use disorder, 51% psychiatric or other mental health conditions, and then 21% other health conditions. Okay. And generally for the other demographic questions, were it's they very similar? very similar, yes. Were there any pediatric, any, any kids? Um, there were no pediatrics, but there was 37% between 18 and 29. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. So what this does, so, so again, it's across the board of the, of the other conditions that you, are, that you are having to manage and live with um, at the same time. Okay, what this has done, it's been very helpful for us, even though it's been probably a bit um, tedious for you to do the polling. It gives us a sense of, of again, um, who you are without saying your names uh, and, and what your experiences are. Now let's talk about our um, what we're here to talk about, which is what it's like to live with opioid use disorder. We're going to, I'm going to have to have you do one more polling question, for, but then we'll get into raising your hands and, and, and speaking. And the first polling question asks you to think about making trade-offs of, of the, the big the general bothersome health effects that you are facing. And then we're going to get into more specifics. So if I ask you in general, what are the most bothersome health effects related to your or your loved one's opioid use disorder? You can choose up to two things. So it can be the health effects associated with the use of opioids, like we heard Jody talk about some of those. It could be symptoms associated with opioid withdrawal or drug sick, as we, as we heard. Symptoms associated with the cravings, however you think of the word cravings, um, symptoms associated with that or health effects. 
Symptoms are related to your underlying health condition that we just asked you about, or some other big bucket of health effects that we haven't mentioned. Okay. Okay, let's let's see. And on the on the web, get a summary. Uh, on the web, we have about about seventy percent for health effects associated with use of opioids. Um, about thirty eight percent for symptoms associated with withdrawal and cravings, and about twenty seven percent on symptoms because of an underlying condition. Okay. All right. So you're dealing with everything, and and ev and and. And you're having to balance these effects. We heard that nicely from our panelists. Um, would anyone like to start with, anyone like to share more stories about health effects with the use of opioids, like we heard um, Jody talk about um, on, the, on the phone? Anyone like to share some experience about um, the, the effects of using opioids that are the most bothersome to you. And, and we'll go right back with, okay. My name and you can Sharon. state your name if you want. Okay. My name is Sharon. And as far as health effects of using heroin for myself, I used heroin for 40 plus years. I'm now on a methadone maintenance program, thank God. Mm -hmm. And um, I still have scars from my injecting heroin, you know, and people notice it. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. there was one time I wouldn't leave the house without long sleeves on. 102 degrees, I had on long sleeves. But I've gotten a lot better about it now, yeah. you know. I mean, I did it to myself. It is what it is. It's not going to change. So I'm dealing with it, and people who don't get a look, don't look, you know, so. Thank you so much. You know. Thanks. One other, uh, so right here. Thank you. My name is Monica. I'm a person in long-term recovery. Um, what that means is that I haven't had a mind or mood or twin substance in over 12 years. Um, the effects that I still have um, from the effects of the use of opiates, I um have chronic constipation. Um, even after being in recovery for 12 years, I still have to take something to assist me um, in being able to go to the bathroom normally. Um, on average, I sleep about four to five hours a night. Um, when I first became a person in recovery, I didn't sleep for 62 days, even with the help of um, mental health medications like trazodone and um, Seroquel to help me sleep. I may have slept maybe two hours per night. So now on average, I may sleep about five hours. So these are some of the long-term effects of me using heroin. I did use heroin for over 24 years. And even being in recovery for 12 years, these are some of the long-lasting effects that I still deal with on a daily basis after, using, okay. after not using heroin for that okay. amount of time. So great comments about the um, that that the effects can last. The effects of the opioid use can last well beyond the use of the opioids. Uh, let's move on and talk about cravings. And first, I want to ask: Can you know we struggle with this term? And so we would like to know how. What, what does this term mean to you, this idea? And what words do you use to describe whatever feelings you might consider to be cravings? Do you want to know in the beginning, like right when you, like while you're in active use, or do you want to know what it's like now, or do you want to know both? Well, bo both, is, both is good. It is, it is feeling uncomfortable in your own skin and in the pit of your chest. And in your mind, it is the occupying force that is driving you. It is everything hurts. And, that, and you know that once you get that first bit in, it's going to make everything release. 
It's, you're going to not be locked up. You're going to be able to finally relax. That feeling of fight or flight is going to subside. Um, that's in active use. Today, you know, I'm seven years in, and it's a lot of it has to do with when I'm put into a fight or flight feeling, when I have that feeling of being on edge and I'm getting tight again and feeling that push in my chest, my brain goes, you need drugs. That's what you need. That's going to solve this problem. And that's the first response. And that's the first response that's going to be in my head probably for the rest of my life. It's quiet, but it's there. And I have to use other tools to help deal with that. And the more stressful a situation is, the more physically painful a situation is, the worse that craving feeling has. Mm -hmm. When I was getting ready to have my first child, you know, you've got moms that are concerned about everything under the sun when they're about to have a baby. My concern was how am I going to handle being in pain because it's going to cause a craving, and I know that. And... Can I do this without an epidural and without pain medication afterwards? Because I am petrified of putting that in my body, not because of the baby, but because is that going to be the thing that sets me off? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah. I, a lot of head nods. Agree with that distinction. Would anyone else like to follow up on that? I, want, I have a question. Okay. Um, I want to know why... Um, I feel as though if we have something, if, if we have something that's beneficial to the um, cocaine as we do to the heroin, I don't think we would have as many users on the cocaine. You know what I mean? To buying, to buying um, one cap of heroin, you would buy ten things of cocaine. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying, I'm saying it that if you use both heroin and cocaine, right? I think if we had something just as equal to okay. the um, heroin as we do to the cocaine, I don't I think it could be okay. justified. You know what I mean? That's a very important point. I think it's a, a bit beyond what we'll be able to talk about in depth today. But we, we've noted that you have raised the point about the, the challenges of having them both together and the challenges of fixing either one of them. So thank you for the comment. Sarah? Yes. Hi, this is uh, Sharon Hertz. I can say that um, while today we're focused on opioid use disorder, we are concerned about the fact that we don't have treatments for other types of substances with similar problems. And it is um, something that we're working on with a number of other groups as well to try and see what we can do to help facilitate management of those disorders as well. Thank you. Okay, one other person about cra about cravings. We have right up here. Hi, um, I'm Denise Mariano, a parent, um, caregiver. Um, so I just thought I'd give a little insight as to what that looks like for us um, mm -hmm. to see our child with cravings. Um, in the beginning, um, we can't wrap our, our minds around it, but as we travel that journey, um, it was the first time that I looked at that desperation and really understood what my son was going through. So those behaviors, instead of me saying, how could he do this to me? I realized it was a symptom of their um, illness and it allowed me to um, really um, put myself in their shoes and it allowed me to um, be part of that solution. So instead of judging him and shaming him, I did a better job of understanding what he was going through and trying to lift him up. Um, and that was really important for us. So I hope that makes sense Thank from you. a caregiver Thank you. perspective. Very important perspective. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Andrew. I want to share a story, kind of <clears throat> experience I had a few years ago that smashed me in the face one day. Um, <clears throat> so I appreciate fitness. I try to stay you know, physically in shape. When I don't uh, take care of my body, it degrades very, very, very quickly, and I end up in a lot of pain, and bad things happen. Um, so uh, I was meal prepping, trying to eat healthy as well. Um, and one day, you know, life happened, and I couldn't bring my lunch to school. And so I was walking down to the local pizza joint, thinking, uh, 
I'm gonna get a grilled chicken Caesar salad, you know, cause it's, you know, fit, cause fitness and I wanna stay in the track of health and wellness. Um, and I, I, didn't get, I didn't even get to the door and I started like sniffing in the air and I was like, oh geez, you have a gr grilled chicken Caesar salad cause fitness. Uh, and then I, I, as I opened the door, it like really hit me square in the face, this intoxicating scent of pizza, right? Um, and then I looked over and I saw glistening in the case under this warm heat lamp. And it was summertime out, but I still wanted to just kind of like curl up underneath that heat lamp with the pepperoni pizza and just kind of like snuggle with it. Um, and all of a sudden I was like off to the races in my head battling, just like, uh, no, but you know, fitness and you're doing so good. And you know what happens, Andrew, you know, you eat one slice of pepperoni pizza and then you're like getting buff chick wraps and you're, you know, you're into the cookies. I think there's a and, parallel story. Yeah. yeah and, yeah. and yeah. as I'm sitting there and by the way, um, I got up to the line and I was like, oh, I'll have a grilled chicken Caesar salad. Um, while I wait, I'm going to have a slice of pepperoni pizza because I'm not as strong as I like to think I am. But as I'm standing there in line waiting for my food, it hit me. That is lunch. One afternoon. You want to talk about cravings. That was just one afternoon lunch. That resonate, and, uh, that resonate, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, whoa, this might apply a little bit. And I share that story with uh, law enforcement. We do in trainings with law enforcement because they seem to be able to relate to that story quite a bit. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to see if there's any webcast comments on craving. Um, we don't have webcast comments on cravings. We have a few people who are just echoing what we're hearing in the room. Okay, great. We'll we have a couple on some of the other health effects, like social and emotional effects that they're feeling okay. and experiencing. OK, great. We will be talking about the social and emotional effects in a little bit. Right now, I'd like to go on to, uh, yes, Electra. Attorney Mike. So I was wondering if maybe we could see a show of hands of, you know, how many think that cravings is the sort of most accurate term and the one that you use the most and or how many would use a different term to dis describe that sensation so if you know you or your family member or your you, in your support group use the term cravings can you raise your hand okay do you use a different term raise your hand okay let's just go quick round yell out what you I'll say it for obsessions okay here what do you Triggers, okay. Other words, urges, okay. Great, Feeling thanks. Is the one that comes to mind. Oh, someone. Oh, okay. She's like, where's that Which what word? Uh, fiending, as in fiend. Yeah. Fiend. Okay. Okay. Great. Yell out another one. Okay, go go with them. Right. That's more than. Is, yes, go ahead. Is that me? <laughs> um, it's more the process. It's not just the substance craving itself. It's the act of doing it, preparing it, consuming mm -hmm. it, the immediate relief afterward. You know what I mean? Like it's this huge buildup and then, you know, volcanic eruption type of thing. It's like that all, that all alludes to the craving, I guess, Great. that okay. goes with it. Thank you so much. Okay, one more. One more here. Got to have it means you got to have money and you got to struggle. Suppose you don't have money to get it, you're going to get sick. Okay. Yes. So Simple as that. Thank you. That's an important point. One more here. Anticipation. Anticipation. Okay. Okay. All right. One, one more. One more. And then we're going to go on to, to withdrawal or drug sick. I just wanted to point out the... Um, the craving thing when it comes to methadone is similar to opiate cravings with methadone, and it can be described in a different manner. Okay. We'll All right. We're going to be talking about methadone in, in the afternoon, and please raise your hand again. I, there's two, um, two same hats, so I'm going <laughs> to... You should have worn different hats. Um, okay. Let's move on to um, thinking specifically about reducing use or abstaining from opioids, whatever terms. We heard terms withdrawal. We heard terms drug sick. Um, it could be 
things in here that look like cravings to you. But of these effects here, we'd like to know what are the most bothersome symptoms for you, effects for you. So if it's fatigue or lack of energy, oh, you could choose up to three things. Fatigue or lack of energy, A. If it's cognitive effects, so things that happen, your, your brain's not working the way you want it to be. It'll, you can't concentrate or what we call brain fog. Is it working? Okay. Uh, that's B. Anxiety, irritability, or jitteriness. And I think this might be the first time we've used jitteriness as an FDA term, but I think you get the point. That's C. Depression, apathy, boredom. Um, D. E would be insomnia or sleep issues like we heard about. F is nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. G is flu-like symptoms such as fever or body aches. H is pain of any kind. Um, and I would be something else. So again, what bothers you the most? This is what we want to know. All of them? OK, we'll take that point, that if you could choose all of them, you, you, you would. Uh, what, what are we seeing on the web for this? Um, Just generally, what's the most? Sorry, that looks like it's come back in a second. Okay, I'll second. come back. Okay, I think we can close out the polling here. Okay, okay, it's all of them, right? Okay, it's all of them. Um, F, interestingly, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea has the, is amongst the lesser things um, that you're experiencing. It's outweighed by, here in the room by anxiety, irritability, jitteriness, depression, apathy, boredom, or insomnia and sleep issues. Okay. Okay. And on the web, did you want to? Um. The top right now is cognitive effects, um, mm -hmm. anxiety and irritability, and um, then flu-like symptoms, and the rest are roughly around the same. OK, so very similar to here. Um, let's take something, let's take anxiety. And, and here, who, for someone who picked that, um, can you explain that feeling to us? Right there? OK, we'll go with the microphone. It feels like, it's like if you're going to get it. I mean, if OK, so it's an anxiety overall, yeah. Overall, okay. yeah. Overall. OK, anyone else? OK, so the, in the cap? Yeah, it's like if you don't have the money, you can go through anxiety. And, and then the jittery part is like when like somebody described feeling something crawling through your skin. And it's just, and being irritable. OK. It's just. Is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So you, you're really tying in the, the how difficult it is to tease apart feelings you get about when am I going to have when am I going to have the next chance to use versus the feelings that you get that are that are real symptoms that it's probably hard to tease out. It sounds no, like it's it's more about like being scared that you're not going to get it. And that brings the anxiety in because you don't want to be sick. Okay. Sarah. Okay, we'll go here and then we have to do yeah. You can also have an anxiety attack. Okay. Like like a bomb bombing and all yep, that. Yeah, yeah. Because I scared a lady half to death on the on the train one day. Okay. And all what I spit up was pillowcase. Okay. Uh huh. And it was shaking. Mm hmm I scared a half to death. Yeah. So there are times when it's a, a, a panic attack can happen not, that goes beyond just the anxiety you feel every day. I think we have Mitra who has a question. Um, just some clarification. So you have the anxiety because you're thinking of maybe because the question says reducing use. So you have that anxiety that you want to get the opioids. What about anxiety before the opioids? Did you have anxiety? Before the using the, the opioids, and you kind of self-medicated yourself with the opioids. Okay, getting a lot of head nods. Anyone to explain? And we'll go here, and then we'll go back in the back. So my experience is is that 
um, prior to getting clean and staying clean, um, those instances of trying to stop and stay stopped, um, you handle anxiety because you're familiar with the feeling of anxiety that, you know, when you're starting a new job, when life is good, when life, you know, you're doing different things, you feel this and experience anxiety in your body. However, for the addict mind, it is resemblant of withdrawal symptoms. So even though I may not be drug sick, even though I may have not used in 30, 60, 90 days, because my body does not understand, well, rather my mind does not understand that my body will experience anxiety the same way I experience withdrawal. Mm -hmm. My mind will tell my body that I need drugs to manage the anxiety that I'm feeling, which leads me back to using. So it's, it's the miscommunication between mind and body because um, habitually when I feel that, it's associated with the fact that I'm about to go cop. But when you're not using for long periods of time and you feel those anxiety feelings or you feel just the irritability or the jitteriness, the mind associates it with the fact that I'm in withdrawal and because my mind can be stronger than my body, it'll direct me to go use when that's not even mm -hmm. my purpose of going outside that day. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll go back there. Uh, yeah, I would kind of characterize my anxiety as just a symptom of the underlying trauma that I experienced, which is actually something I'm a little shocked that I haven't heard yet as trauma being a huge predictor of developing a substance use disorder, particularly an opiate use disorder. And that's my experience. At 16 years old, I was physically assaulted by an older man. And when I was 23 years old, I was assaulted while under police custody by court officers of the Nassau County uh, prison system. So my anxiety is directly associated with the trauma that I, that I uh, experienced. And I constantly relied on self-medication through cannabis to deal with that anxiety successfully. But without developing any other healthy coping mechanisms, my substance experimentation gravitated towards opiates uh, eventually, which were far better at alleviating anxiety in the short term than cannabis was. But uh, once they stop working, they stop working. And that's all I wanted to continue to do was figure out a way to get them to work again. Thank you. You're, you're making this very important point about, about how complex the issue, if you can address your OUD, there may have been a reason that you be had OUD. And so the needing to understand what is what and address both of those at the same time. OK, we have lots of hands that we're going to go here. And then, um, and then I want to, um, if there are people on the phone, who would like to talk about a health effect that you haven't heard much about or your experience, or it's really, really bothersome to you, um, please feel free to um, join the phone. There are some instructions on the webcast. OK, right okay, here. This is Sharon again. I had anxiety as a child. I was shy as a child, which when I got like about 14, it led me to alcohol because the alcohol like kept me from being shy. I became more outgoing. And the first time I tried heroin, I didn't graduate from one to the other. I went from alcohol to heroin. And the heroin seemed to have done a better job with my being, you know, it, uh, uh, shy. You know, mm -hmm. I became the life of the party. Mm -hmm. So I tended to stick with that because I didn't like being withdrawn, you know, mm -hmm. and hating to go out of the house, not wanting to be around people, feeling that everybody was looking at me. Mm -hmm. So the heroin took care of that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any, anyone on the phone? You're showing no comment from the phone line. Okay. If you want to come on the phone, um, then just dial in. Um, there was some. Oh, there's a. Okay, in the back there, Shannon. Thanks. So I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety before my drug use, and that manifested into eating disordered, which then manifested into opiate use for me. Um, so my anxiety before was a black hole, and then. The using and also the withdrawal exacerbated that issue as well. So anxiety for me is like 
deep, dark hole, I wanting of something I can't quite understand, and then nothing in this world would satiate that anxiety, and trying to reach for something, but wanting nothing to do with the process of fixing it. So, yeah, that's about, that's about anxiety for me. <laughs> Thanks. Any other um, symptoms that you want to follow up on before we get, go ahead, Electra? I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the insomnia or sleep issues, uh, people's experience, and whether that's related to any of the other symptoms, perhaps anxiety, um, just, you know. Okay. So is your fatigue or, or sleep issue a symptom of something else that keeps you up at, at night or, or, or other thing? Well, it was sort of, it was kind of a chicken and the egg problem. Mm -hmm. Is um, the sleep related to the anxiety and okay. then the fatigue after that? Okay, any comment? Go, we'll go back there. <coughs> as far as anxiety, um, as a survivor from being molested at a young age, and uh, I suffer with anxiety and then couldn't figure out what I wanted to do in life I was dealing with that. And using drugs was desired to get even worse. I didn't even know I was going through that till I was diagnosed from a doctor, you know. So relating to what the young lady over there said, from a child, you know, you just you grow up with it. Mm -hmm. You don't know how to feel, what you're feeling, you know. You, you just don't know. Yes, over here. Um, Shane. <laughs> Um, I think been thinking about reducing or abstaining from opioids, um, my mind goes to having to think about, you know, the trauma that, that I went into. So, um, you know, not being able to use is meaning having to have my life in my face again in, in, in the past experience, maybe PTSD or, or, or something, mm -hmm. depression, boredom, when I'm not going to be able to have drugs, but I'm just going to have to really be back into the trauma. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so I I, need, I do need to t take a time check because we are at twelve o'clock. Can I can I go um, fifteen minutes into lunch? Even we'll we'll let lunch go a couple minutes after. Is that okay? Are we okay? This is an important topic. All right, we're gonna take a few more, and then I do want to get to another polling question that's very important. So we'll go here. We'll go with you, and then you, and then we'll. Um... Yes. How you doing? My name is Stephen. Um, doing my drug use, sleeping was hard for me. Um, I would sleep, I would have naps. I wouldn't sleep, it would be more so as naps. And it led into me having more anxiety. Okay. You know, so um, it was it was very, very hard for me because I, I just like, I could not sleep. And right now I still suffer from it. Okay. I cannot sleep, I had to go through various tests, you know what I'm saying, to find out why I could not sleep a whole night. I go, I, I take naps, I take 15, 20 minute naps. Okay. Every night. So short naps. Mm -hmm. yeah, like okay. the short naps. Short naps. Okay, right here. And then I understand we have someone on the phone. Okay. Two people on the phone, okay. Good morning, Yvonne. Um, you asked about the anxiety and how it affects your sleepness. I used to um, be anxious and also have the racing thoughts. So that would keep me woke with my thoughts racing on back then, uh, what's going to happen, what I'm going to have to do. All that kept me, the, the, rate, the thoughts wouldn't stop. So that's how my okay. anxiety um, affected my sleep. Thank you very much. We have um, on the phone, operator, can we have a caller, please? Our first caller is caller number one. Your line is now open. Thanks. Yes. Yes, thank you um, for the opportunity to share. I just wanted to say um, the, the protracted withdrawals, the long-term withdrawals are the things that, made it so hard for me and even now after being on methadone and then suboxone for years I reducing my dose I still uh, have issues but like I detoxed a bunch of different times and I could get through that first week of being sick but I couldn't function the longest I ever went was like five months and still I would have nights of what I call the skin crawls mm -hmm. um, where you can't lay still, you never mind go to sleep, um, your body just jerks and, 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 you know, anxiety, anxiety attacks, you feel like a cat on a hot tin roof, and 
it went on and on and it never did get better. I know some people get off of opiates and apparently they do get better, but I had to go in medically assisted treatment to get my life back. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have one more caller. Operator? Next comment comes from caller number two. Your line is now open. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is um, Jerry Lynn Utter. I'm actually a doctor of clinical psychology and um, I guess a caregiver, my mother has suffered with opioid use disorder for 20 years. So um, just to kind of, you know, in listening to everything, I feel like I'm listening to um, to my mom. And then as a professional, somebody that specializes in addiction, I can just really emphasize. And what I just wanted to kind of reiterate as far as the comorbidity with post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, it's something that we see very commonly, depression. And, you know, when you have years of, of drug abuse, I just kind of want to reiterate to you that there is actual brain chemistry that changes and the way that your brain functions, functions changes. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of, you know, of, of willpower and, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. This is an actual brain disease. Mm -hmm. So everything that you're talking about as far as trauma, anxiety, depression, it's all symptomatic mm -hmm. and reflective of the disease of addiction. So medication-assisted treatment, somebody mentioned, and if it works for you, if it's buprenorphine or methadone, if it's something that works for you and helps to manage, you know, cravings, anxiety, then, you know, it, it's something that's actually helping with your brain neurotransmission. So, you know, just to kind of echo what folks are saying, I just want you to know that, you know, as somebody in the field, but also as a child of somebody who is addicted, I empathize with you. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, from a, from a care standpoint, you know, we can't just look at opioid use disorder linearly. We have to look at all of the mental health issues that come on top of either being addicted for many years or using opioids to self-medicate mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, and trauma. So when you do enter into treatment, you know, opioid use disorder is just one thing that you're going to work on. You're going to have to really work on everything in order to feel whole or, or, or whatever mm -hmm. your normal is again. Yeah. So I just kind of wanted mm -hmm. to, to share that and thank everybody here today for, for participating because I really empathize and understand your pain. Thank you so much. There were a lot of head nods in the room, and no, you can't see us. It's going to be a nice transition to our discussion on treatment approaches and what you look for out of treatments uh, in the afternoon. I do want to make sure that we get to one more polling question because it's important. It's not thinking so much about symptoms, but about how these, what OUD has, that there are bigger impacts. Oh, we have, just, yeah, just we'll take one question, one comment, and then we'll, you can, um, we'll do the polling we questions. In recovery, it, it, didn't, it, did, it didn't take us overnight to get like this. So yeah. when you get clean, it's going to take you some yes. time. Yes, yes to get the brain back and mm -hmm. that normal feeling because some of us don't even know what normal feels like That's right. because we was polluted with drugs mm -hmm. for many years and I say that because with me when I got clean a lot of health issues fell into play yeah. they were there all along but self-medicating yes know? thank you and sleeping yeah. is one of the things you go through Thank you so much for that. Um, so then transitioning into these impacts on your or your loved one's daily life. Okay, you can choose up to three things. So this is what's the most, what were the, where are the biggest impacts for you? Okay. A, your ability to carry out important activities like go to school, work, do hobbies that are really important to you, be on the sports teams. B, ability to care for yourself or your family. See, having days when I'm barely able to function at all. D, concerns about risks to, safe, risks to safety of self or others. E, impact on relationships with family and friends. F, stigma or discrimination. G, worry about the future, such as worrying about relapse or overdose um, or other things that you, um, your family. H, emotional impacts, such as self-esteem, self-identity, or I, other impacts not mentioned. This is a hard, hard question, and I promise we will stop and have a break and lunch after, after this. 
Do you have a question? Yes. Oh, oh, there were some. Let me, let's just see what the polling questions come, and then I'll come to it. OK, so let's, um, is, is anyone still working, uh, still thinking? OK, yeah, OK, let's give a few more minutes. Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. So it's really interesting um, that trauma came up, and I love that it did. Um, I have this, I don't know if it's my own or if it's just came from somewhere else, but I have this wildly, you know, radical idea that uh, recovery actually starts with the use post-traumatic event. Uh, and you hear this a lot, you know, sexual abuse, physical abuse, or some traumatic event that kicks off uh, seeking of relief from that. Um, the chemistry degree um, my capstone I actually did around the brain chemistry of trauma mm -hmm. um, and how it has very causal links to, um, to you know, uh, neurodegenerative diseases mm -hmm. such as ALS, Parkinson's, al Alzheimer's, um, but also a lot of substance use, uh, depression, anxiety. And I was really curious to see how uh, that same biological process is playing out in other ways in our body and mm -hmm. uh, come to find out that uh, your skin cells actually react uh, to the sunlight in a similar fashion. Uh, the UV light breaks apart the skin cells, creating free radical oxidatives uh, that go on and just kind of bond with anything and react with anything in its path and creating a lot of nasty, toxic things, including sunburns. Uh, and if you get repeated overexposure, mm -hmm. uh, cancers, skin cancers. Uh, tr trauma is, in short, the uh, sunburn of the brain. Okay. Um, and we're finding our sunscreen in drugs and alcohol. It just so happens that it's an unaffective or uh, sustainable, you know, solution. And so we're really, like, I really hope we can tease out some, you know, productive and positive sunscreens for this uh, brain trauma and the sunburn. Thank you for the analogy. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so thinking about the big impacts, it's, it's, it's everything. You've identified everything, and nothing stands out more than, than every, there, it, Sounds like it would. This was probably a very difficult question, so we appreciate you you um, answering it. Um, but the emotional impacts, the stigma or discrimination, which we heard about, the ability to function, um, uh, having days where you're barely able to function at all, let alone go to work. Um, I'd like to hear what the effects are, um, the the impacts on the phone are. Um, yeah. So very wide. Um, dispersion of uh, results. We have about 46% for ability to carry out important activities, 42% with having days not being able to function, 50% um, family and friends, um, and then about 30 to 35% for stigma, worry about the future, and emotional impacts. Okay. So I want to, um, I'm going to close with one question, which is, um, it surprises me that be ability to care for myself or family was not as as high of a choice for the folks in the room. Um, does anyone have, in from your experience, a possible reason why you didn't put that? You put other things, but not that one as your top. We'll go back there, and maybe we'll take one more, and then we'll close up for for lunch. Go ahead. Particularly because other things were a little more salient. I mean, I wouldn't deny that the ability to care for myself and family is an important thing, but uh, in particular, I identified stigma as the most important okay. thing because, quite frankly, opiate use disorder is not going to make a tremendous progress towards a solution until we remove the criminal justice component from it. Sure, there are crimes that are committed during the process, but if, by definition, certain characteristics of this disorder are inherently criminal, that's never going to end okay, without that Good criminal point. justice Good point. We'll go component. Right here, and then we'll take two um, more because you had your hand up, and then we'll go to you, and then we'll and then we will have to go to lunch. I'm I'm designing a program to educate judges okay. about okay. Uh, opioid use, and and so I'd be interested if you have a chance to ask the people in this room who used or are using opioids uh, whether they ever uh, had an experience with the law, whether uh, an arrest. For example. Okay. Can we do it as just a show of yeah. hands? Are you comfortable raising your hands if you've had an experience with with the law? And you should come talk to me when you're done this. Because oh, <laughs> yes, you should come okay. talk to me. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna move on. We have we're gonna go with you, and then we'll close with with you. Go ahead. Right here at the with no with the dark shirt on. 
Yeah, my, my question is uh, the ability to care for mm -hmm. my family when actually watching my mom trying to raise nine kids by herself, being abused by my father, and that led me to go out and sell drugs and being in prison, so. Okay, all right, so that's a, a different perspective on being able to take care of yourself and family. We're gonna have, we're gonna go there? No, I think you're absolutely right. You know, when you said that, you're right, that it should be A, but, um, but for me it was um, um, not being able to have meaningful relationships, but, but maybe it's part of the opiate use disorder disease that my, my brain disease doesn't even make me think I need to take care of myself. You know what I mean? I'm just wondering if that's a part of it. Oh. That should be A, but it's not, you yeah? know? Well, there was no judgment in my, in my question. Um, it was just a, an observation. Um, okay, let's see. Since we've heard, I'm going to go to this gentleman we haven't heard from, and then we'll go summarize anything on the webcast. My name, Wayne. The, the reason why I had the ability to consume, I found out I was a, a addicted to dope. I let my mother, I gave her the assets of my bank account. Yep, yep, so thank you, yes. Okay, um, so we have one question, then we'll summarize. One. So quick, one quick follow. question before lunch. Um, worry about overdose. Can I see a show of hands who are worried? I mean, just uh, individuals, caregivers uh, that are worried about overdose. Even if you're in recovery. Yeah. Okay. And any solutions for it? Uh -huh. Okay, so oh, I, maybe let's, afterwards. Let's, we can see if we can come afterwards. Here's what I wanted. There's a couple things. If you feel comfortable on the webcast typing it, this in over the lunch time or sometime, or if you feel comfortable submitting comments to our public website, what we haven't talked about was relapse and your experiences with it. Um, and what maybe we can get to a little bit of that this afternoon. We also haven't talked about OUD during pregnancy. If you have experiences or perspectives on that, please um, share those. Um, and then um, what worries you most about living? I think we've gotten through that in the, in the conversation. So a summary of the webcast, please. Um, so we heard uh, several people talking about why they didn't choose the uh, ability to care for myself or family. They said they had other things they considered more important, such as their worries about work and staying employed. Um, other people said that they just chose options that they felt actually defined caring for self and family, um, such as days not being able to function or inability to go to school or work. Um, and for a lot of other people talking about some of the trauma that they had experienced and what they started using opioids for to try and deal with it. And then other people also echoing some of the incidents with the law and other types of issues like that. Thank you. You can keep the webcast coming in. We're going to close for, for lunch now. We will give you the full hour. Um, and so we'll start promptly at 1.15, and we'll make up time in the afternoon. First, though, can I have the everyone give a round of applause for just fantastic input today, this morning? Thank you very much. If you have any questions, come find Pujita or myself, and we can answer them. Thank you.